Okay, so why do we buy? I guess that's one of the questions. And this question has been uh, attempted to be answered from a number of different levels for a number of different years. Starting off, for example, there's um, a sense that we buy because we have various different needs. Okay, so at the very basic needs are physiological needs to eat, drink, et cetera, et cetera. So we buy to fulfill those needs. The theory goes that once those needs are fulfilled, we move on to something else, being interested in things like safety, being secure, being out of danger. And so we purchase to satisfy those needs needs also. Um, and the theory goes that where, when we have all our esteem needs met in terms of we are felt, we, we are regarded positively by those around us, we are interested in self-actualization needs, which is about realizing one's potential. So with this framework in mind, it does give us some insight as to why purchasers purchase. But the problem is we're not as straightforward as that. We buy for all sorts of other reasons too. So for example, we buy for physical factors, meaning if we're thirsty, we'll buy a drink. We buy for self-image factors, which explains why some people in their mid-60s buy a small red sports car. We buy for various different values. So for example, if people are interested in recycling, we'll make some purchases that are easily recyclable. Um, and we buy because of learning. You know, what we learn about ourselves, what we learn about our preferences, we buy for those reasons too. But it doesn't even stop there. In fact, we buy for all sorts of symbolic reasons, and we buy different things because they carry different symbolism. So for example, what we buy for our in-laws might be different to what we buy, might buy for ourselves. We buy because there's a sale on, like promotional reasons. Uh, we buy out of utility. You know, we want something to do something, so we buy it. Uh, we buy out of impulse. Uh, we buy out of hedonism, just pure pleasure. Or we buy for, you know, no reason, just go and buy. So what we're seeing is that consumer is a very complex and largely irrational um, species from time to time, and that's what a marketer has to be aware of. Essentially, companies need to know who's who in your consumer base, where do they come from, what are they buying for, and why are they buying. And the upshot of that is market segmentation, which gives companies very clear ideas as to who their purchaser is. The problem is, again, though, that that doesn't explain everything because actually we're largely irrational beings that make no sense for a lot of our existence. Here's a few examples. Um, firstly, losses are weighed more heavily than gains. So this is about bells and whistles. So if you think you're adding bells and whistles to your product, be careful of what bells the consumer thinks you're taking away because that is actually valued more. Here's another example about discounts. We make all sorts of uh, detours in order to make a small saving. So, for example, a 10 euro discount on a 20 euro product, but actually can't be bothered shopping around for the same discount on a 500 euro product. Here's another example of familiarity. We assign far more value to the thing we've heard of, even if we don't know anything else about it. And here's some examples of this. So three jars, identical jars, with the identical peanut butter inside them. Next thing, a label is put on one of them, and 75% of respondents said, yep, yeah, that's the one I liked, that one tastes the best. Prior to that, there was actually no difference whatsoever. Here's another example. Children given the exact same chicken nuggets and chips, the ones wrapped in McDonald's wrapping paper, yep, yeah, they're the ones, they're the tastier, they're far nicer. Here's another example in the airline industry done for the University of Cologne. So respondents were asked to pick an airline carrier, and understandably, 75% of people who um, were familiar with a certain brand picked, picked the one that they knew. Um, next, uh, second part of the experiment was that people were given three pieces of problematic data, you might say, for example, with respect to safety. 67% of people still picked the carrier that they knew, despite the fact that the information was problematic concerning its safety record. So what we're seeing really is that the consumer is irrational. Here's some more examples. Free is the big word. In an experiment, uh, respondents were asked to pick either a Hershey Kiss, this, so this is the American uh, material, a Hershey Kiss um, or a Lint Truffle. So the price of the Hershey Kiss was one cent, uh, the price of the Lint Truffle was 14 cent. Understandably, 27% went for the kind of maybe cheap and nasty, and 73% went for the gourmet product. Next thing, the price is reduced. So for example, the Hershey Kiss is now free. In other words, one cent has been reduced from the price. And the price of the, Hershey, of the Lindt chocolate was also reduced by one cent down to 13 cent. The upshot of that is everybody jumps ship. 31% now go for the Lindt, and 73% go for the free product. Here's a few more examples. One is about anchor prices. So an experiment was done 
and employees or a sample was asked about their last uh, two digits of their social security number. And so if the last two digits was 79 or the last two digits was 48, respondents were asked, well, would you pay that much for various different things? For example, a bottle of French wine, a, a box of Belgian chocolates, or a cordless keyboard. So they just asked to think about that. And then an auction took place. The people whose sec social security number ended in 79 bid far higher than the people whose social security number was lower. So what that is suggesting is that the high, the, the simulation anchored a high price in their mind. Here's another example, magazine subscription options. So the first option is a web only subscription, second is print only, and third is print web combination. So understandably, these are all at different prices. So you've got the web only at 59 euros, the print only at 125 euros, and the print web combination at 125 euros. And understandably, you can imagine that, well, nobody went for the expensive one, which was print only, um, whereas the uh, population was split 16% for web only for the lower price. And interestingly, 84% went for the print and web combination. But when the print only subscription option was removed, in other words, there was only web only and print web at exactly the same prices, the situation reversed. And the reason for this, so essentially you had 68% choosing the web only, whereas prior to that it was only 16%. And what's going on here is essentially the print only option acts as a decoy. So it convinces the consumer that the combination is a bargain, but when the decoy disappears, so too does the perception of the bargain. This is a picture of Walmart in the US, and Walmart did some, um, this is actually post the earlier recession in the US, and what they did was streamline their stores and make the wide aisles really nice and wide, and uh, lots of space, and God, the consumers loved it. Consumer satisfaction went through the roof, but purchasing went through the floor. And the reason is that people associate value with clutter and expense with space. And so they, they cluttered up their aisles again. This, they essentially, they re-refurbished such that um, stores that were you know, bare and streamlined were now busy. Lots of stores have done similar things. For example, JC Penney's is adding another foot to the height of their shelving. Um, and very, I was interested in, in the movies that uh, talk as well in terms of incorporating other products into your area, whether or not they're part of your business. If they make the place look busy, there's a sense of value and consumers respond very positively to that. Um, and I suppose what we need to recognize is it's all about the dopamine. You know, there's a lot going on in our brains and that is really what uh, marketers and um, uh, store owners, etc., are grappling with. So what we need to recognize is that there's a brain reaction going on, so we get excited with shopping. It's novel, it's new, it's exciting, it's challenging, and it gives us that hit of dopamine. We really like to shop in new places because they're even more exciting, and so that's why there are nice uh, diamond showrooms on the center streets of big cities because tourists are at work. Uh, another aspect of the dopamine is that um, the, the whole thing is that ant anticipation is the really big thing. So we really like to window shop. We li really like to hunt for bargains because that keeps that hit uh, coming again and again and again. Also, uh, another point to make is that let us use our credit cards because the further we are away from the pain of the purchase, the more we're likely to spend. So cash tempers purchase. So let us use our credit cards and keep that dopamine hit going. What is critical is that its anticipation is key. The really big thing is getting the consumer nearly to work to buy your product because once the purchase is made, prolactin kicks in and the hit is gone. And that explains why there are so many pairs of unworn shoes in people's wardrobes. So what we're recognizing is that, you know, the consumer is irrational. There is so much that we can tie down, but so much that is also um, beyond us. And that's the type of mindset, along with a range of other factors that consumers bring to bear to a recession. Within a recession, try and think of your cons consumers as falling into four groups. And this is based on a really good work from uh, Harvard University. The four groups are as follows. Now, also remembering that consumers are irrational, and so at some level, you've got to kind of hold categories somewhat lightly. 
rather than assume that they're absolutely tied down and, and utterly, um, uh, utterly valid forevermore. The slam on the brakes segment. This segment of the market is the most vulnerable and the hardest hit financially. They're generally speaking low income consumers, but can include high income consumers who have fallen on hard times. The second is the pained but patient category. And between pained and patient and slam on the brakes, they're the biggest sections of your market. So these consumers are resilient and optimistic about the long term. So they may be quite um, uh, problematized right now, but in the long term, they're kind of holding up their head and, and holding, uh, holding their nerve. Um, they're less confident about their ability to maintain their standard of living. Um, and there's all sorts of different income levels in there because it's about confidence. It's not just about income. What happens, though, nonetheless, is as the news get worse, these people migrate increasingly into the slam and the brakes segment. The third segment, and this would be the smallest, is the comfortably well-off consumer. So this consumer would, con or this would comprise the top 5% income bracket people within your market. And they feel secure about their ability to ride out bumps in the economy because they have probably made more stable investments in the first instance. And then the last category is the live for, live for the day. This category of the market will be um, young, generally urban dwellers, more likely to rent rather than own. Take note, Sherry Fitz. Uh, and they spend on experiences rather than stuff, except for electronics. So they'll certainly want all the, you know, highest gear, gadgetry stuff. And this bunch uh, keep on going, unless they become unemployed. But other than that, they just keep going. So that's one way of considering your market in a recession. Now you need to ask, well, who's buying what? Well, firstly, what is bought? You could identify four different categories of purchases. You've got essentials, treats, postponables, and expendables. So what happens in a recession is that essentials, such as maybe eating out, maybe new clothes, maybe appliances, what these now move into is the treat section. Treats, such as, for example, uh, garden care, domestic help, or entertainment. These purchases now move into the postponable section. Postponables and what had been there, for example, uh, dental care or refurbishment or travel, these dimensions, largely speaking, but remember not everybody has exactly the same approach, but largely speaking, these postponables move into the expendable category. And whatever was in the expendable category, for example, luxuries, maybe retirement, maybe a new car, taken together, most of these actually become history within a recession. Okay. Okay, but the point is, not everybody is the same. So for example, and I'm just gonna give you the top two, so for example, I'll talk about the slam and the brakes and the pain the patient. So the slam and the brakes people, in terms of essentials, they will seek lower cost product and brand substitute, such as own label, and this is exactly where SuperValue and a lot of other companies have really nailed it. In terms of treats, they will deeply reduce or eliminate or seek lower cost substitutes. In terms of postponables and expendables, they really don't happen all that much. So what do you do? Your tactics for slamming the brakes in relation to essentials. So the essentials are the things, you know, food and bread and maybe the odd treat at the weekend, that type of thing, emphasize price, offer smaller pack size for less money, and expand retailer private labels are some of the tactics. And what about the treats? Because everybody does need a little bit of a treat. Well, shrink sizes, hold the prices down, and advertise it as a you deserve a small indulgence. One thing to bear in mind is that there are still expendables. There are still things that people have to do. Like, for example, they might have to replace windows. They might, you know, for drafts and, you know, in terms of... Um, uh, saving on heating costs or whatever, offer a do-it-yourself alternative as opposed to doing without. Um, just last week I saw a company that replaces just the windows and not just the frames. So you're not losing light altogether, but you're making it an option that is in some way um, available to this type of consumer. Uh, in terms of the um, pained but patient, so the, the response of the pained but patient uh, consumer is uh, with respect to essentials, they'll certainly seek out favorite brands at lower prices, but will settle also for cheaper, less preferred alternatives. They're also good for stocking up on good deals, so they will certainly want the 24 cans of Diet Coke at 7.95 or whatever it is, um, rather than do without altogether. The uh, tactics for the pain but patient person is to promote these bonus packs, as I was just saying, and maybe also emphasize the dependability of the branded product or service, because you don't want to lose these people altogether. 
For the other two, this is the comfortably well off. So in ter their response to the recession in terms of essentials, they kind of keep going. They'll keep uh, uh, buying their favorite brands at pre-recession levels. But what they do is that they try and be less conspicuous in their consumption. I, with respect to treats, they'll be more selective in purchasing luxuries. And with respect to postponables, they'll look for better quality and will certainly negotiate harder at a point of sale. So how do you respond to them? Well, continuous awareness advertising. You keep that uh, aspect of your marketing budget going. But promote savings from buying now and also advise customers that they're missing out maybe by postponing. So what we're seeing here, and I'll just run through, is that no one cap fits everybody. And this is an example of Dell and how they looked at the market and advertised appropriately. So for the slam and the brakes segment of the market, they said, out of the box, within your means. That was the tagline. In relation to the pained but patient person, they said, depend on Dell for simple solutions in tough times. So again, a very different message, tapping a very different um, starting point. For the comfortably well off, the tagline was, the ideal laptop works anywhere in any economy. And for the live for today segment, it was weak economy, powerful you. So the same product was just being sold very differently simply because of the mindset of the person receiving the message. In broad terms, there are some winners and losers. So the winners in a recession will be things like home security systems. People are staying longer at home. They're more concerned about security. Another winner will be computer repairs and all sorts of repair services because people will postpone replacing products um, and will repair them. Another winner is frozen vegetables because and frozen segment of the supermarket because people move away from organic and fresh to frozen. And another winner is ice cream because this scene is a little bit of a treat. The losers would be things like uh, skincare regimes because people move away from cleansers, toners, moisturizers into a product that, you know, where one does everything. Another loser is upscale magazines because ad ad rev revenue falls because people are not buying the magazines. Another loser is uh, health clubs because people just go for a walk in the park rather than pay expensive um, f um, uh, membership fees. In terms of products that do a little bit of both, interestingly, we see televisions, for example, they go up and down. They go up in that people think, well, it's a small treat. We're not going away on holiday, so we'll have a decent TV. Just to finish, the point is, I guess, staying strong and, and trying to remain positioned for recovery. Know who your consumer is and absolutely know who your core consumer is and why it is they're buying. Reward loyalty, even if people buy less, so that they feel that you're looking after them. Know your brand. Is it an essential? Is it an expendable? Is it a postponable? And uh, carry out kind of surgery, really, on your brand. So you maintain the strong brands, but you eliminate those that really need to be on life support. Stay visible. Out of sight is out of mind. TV advertising is still critical. Discount appropriately. Don't reduce the cost of your product such that people now see that your product is in a different category altogether and will feel that they have been moved nearly to the yellow pack brigade, which nobody particularly likes. The other point is that if you reduce too much, when the recovery comes, people will have your reduced price in their head as the normal price and will resent you hiking it back up again. And then finally, boast to trust. And what that really is all about is sending the message that we're all in this together. And if we help each other, we'll all get through to the end. Thank you very much.